You're watching the 50 states of AR-15 on Big Gunner 81. Brought to you by BATArms.com. Welcome everyone to the 50 states of AR-15. Today we're actually going to be talking with uh, Terry, the founder of Hyperfire Triggers. Terry, thanks for joining us. Yes, glad to be here. Yeah, like, I'm glad you're here. I appreciate it. I appreciate your support for this project, too, of course. Uh, we've got some interesting things to talk about. So tell us a little bit about the history of Hyperfire. How did you get started into the world of, of triggers and AR-15 components and things? Well, it's it could be a long story. I'll try to keep it short. But uh, back in 2001, I wanted to buy a semi-automatic 50 caliber rifle. And you could probably guess uh, what that rifle was. Mm -hmm. uh, but I saw uh, immediately that it had uh, some shortcomings because the barrel had to re-register with the receiver uh, after cycling. Uh, it didn't line up with the optics uh, consistently. Uh, and that's why it was an anti-material weapon and not, an, not an anti-personal weapon. Uh, and I just began toying around because I had an interest. Uh, I had an engineering consulting firm at that time. I wasn't doing anything firearms related. Uh, but I've always been interested in gadgets and I like to do things uh, differently. I draw outside the box, you know, basically. So uh, that started in 2001. In 2005, I got four patents on the rifle and I began to shop uh, the rifle around and trying to get some equity investment in that. Uh, I spent a lot of personal money, uh, did some prototypes and did some testing. It was quite successful for as far as I went with it. But uh, back in 2010, I went before some investors uh, for the last time. I was going to hang this whole business up uh, unless uh, something transpired. So they got very excited about the rifle, but they got more excited about some of the uh, things within the rifle. And one of the things that was noticed uh, was a trigger system, which looks suspiciously like the HyperTouch triggers. And uh, they asked me if that could be adapted to the AR-15 platform. And of course, I said uh, yes. And a week, or af a week after that meeting in January, I formed Hyperfire, uh, High Performance Firearms LLC and filed the first application, patent application on the triggers. Um, and it wasn't until the spring of 2013 that I introduced the first trigger product, HyperTouch 24. And then in August of that same year at uh, Rock Castle at the AR15.com Pro-Am Three Gun uh, Championship, I introduced the 24 Elite and 24C. Uh, at about that time, I thought the, the trigger product family was going to be three, and now it's eight. Yes. Uh, we've, just, we've just developed uh, full auto uh, triggers, um, and they'll be coming out around SHOT Show. They've been tested. Um, they work like full autos, but when you switch the semi, you have a, a very high quality, uh, you know, match grade, competition grade, hunting grade uh, trigger, which, which has incredible finesse. Uh, so... Uh, until last year in July, when I moved into the commercial space, uh, you can see one of the banners from SHOT Show in back of me. Uh, I did all of this out of a 9 by 10 bedroom. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a typical, uh, you know, garage or bedroom type uh, startup. And uh, my interest was in making uh, sound products. And after the universal uh, praise we received from three gunners who adopted them, uh, then it was time to expand. So... Right now, uh, this has been uh, uh, almost a, a year and a couple, three months uh, in the commercial space. We expanded into Bay Next Door. Uh, I've got employees. Uh, we expect orders to start picking up. We have a marketing strategy to go forward with. And uh, right now, the sales have been largely word of mouth. Uh, there have been a few uh, ads, you know, sprinkled here and there. But uh, we have a marketing campaign, and we're going to let uh, you know, active shooters know about us, and we expect to pick up in business. Very cool. And, and in case I didn't mention it, they are from Minnesota, for those who don't know, and if I didn't say it already, um, and we are using their ECL. Eclipse. There's basically a, a plated version of the 24C, the 24 competition version. So that's what we're using here in the Minnesota rifle. Got to hold it up. This is part of it, low receiver here, kind of still building it out. But uh, it's a pretty interesting trigger. Now, we'll have to kind of show a close-up of it later on, but you can see you know, the interesting spring setup. Can you kind of describe a little bit of the kind of theory behind that design and what, you know, what all it accomplishes, I guess, is the way to put it? Well, it, it accomplishes many things. In fact, I have 23 videos planned to discuss the technology uh, or the technological benefits uh, of this trigger. It's a system unlike anything else out there. And the videos will uh, very uh, ably demonstrate that. But 
the problem I was wrestling with with the 50 cal was uh, I had to hit the primer pretty hard to get consistent, uh, you know, consistently high muzzle velocity, which is an aid to accuracy uh, downrange. Uh, but the trigger weight uh, was really high. And uh, especially in a rifle like that, uh, flinch became an issue. I needed something smoother, something that had a, a surprising break. Uh, so I could, in that way, take the human factor out. And I was the only human firing the thing. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't say I, I was trying to uh, come up with a trigger design. Um, I wasn't thinking of commercializing a trigger. I was working on the rifle. So I was wrestling with, uh, you know, what am I going to do to make this trigger uh, more responsive, uh, to make it pull lightly but hit really hard? And I just had an inspiration. I, I just put toggle springs on it like you would uh, find springs in a light switch. Uh, and it worked. Uh, it worked very well. Um, the second thought, which was immediate after I had the idea, was uh, someone had to have come up with this. This, this is too good to be true. I'm, I'm too lucky. But it turns out no one did. And uh, I have a patent now. Uh, at least one of my LLCs has a, a patent uh, on the toggle spring system. And very it cool. solves many problems, many, many, many problems. Such as what exactly? Well, I mean, just so we can explain a little bit in depth. Right. Well, the spring force on the hammer is at a maximum when the hammer is fully cocked. And as the hammer falls onto the firing pin, uh, that spring force uh, drops off. Uh, and this triggers just the opposite. Uh, when the hammer is fully cocked, uh, the toggle springs are antagonistic with the hammer spring. So it actually unloads force on the sear. That's how we get lightweight. And then when it falls over center and then onto the hammer, uh, it picks up a spring force. So. Uh, and I wasn't the first one to use this, but many people liken the system to a compound archery bow. As, as you draw the string back, the force lets off. So when you let go, you're in a relaxed state. So that's exactly what happens here. Now, because you have less uh, uh, force on the sear, you have less friction, and less trigger weight. Every other trigger, to reduce trigger weight, they have to dial back the power of the hammer spring. So you'll find that all the cassettes and most every other trigger system out there uh, will light strike. In other words, you won't have a failure to fire, but we hit the primer light and then you don't get a consistently high power burn. And then you get variations in your muzzle velocity, which uh, results in variations at, in your group size uh, at your target. So the biggest thing uh, that we're pushing, but we're gonna be pushing other things uh, apart from the feel uh, is uh, the hammer fall, heavy hammer fall uh, with user adjustable light weights. And then there are uh, you know, there's secondary effects that, that go behind that. For instance, if you have less force on your sear, you have less friction, less wear. So these triggers will outlast anything else out there. I was just going to ask that question Sorry. about the effect of the wear. Makes sense, though. Less pressure on it, less wear. Very cool. Yeah, and, the, yeah, and these triggers, again, I, uh, the Eugene Stoner concept, the trigger concept of the AR is great. The problem is you, you have a very large cre creep budget, and how do you manage that? So this system allows... Uh, uh, any shooter to to manage uh, his his hammer release, uh, his his trigger break because of the lightweight and because it's smooth. It's not only smooth and lightweight on the pole, but it has the same lightweight uh, on trigger let off when you're resetting. So it gives you positive, very positive control in both directions. And then also the other feature I noticed besides the fact that you have the toggle springs that you can actually change out this uh, shoe for the trigger, it's adjustable. So if you want to tell us a little bit about the idea right. behind that one. Well, the, uh, the HyperTouch 24 triggers come with uh, three springs, uh, three pairs of springs. So you have three unique adjustments by using those springs to adjust your trigger weight, uh, as well as your hammer fall uh, your striking power. Uh, but with the shoe, because it indexes the five different positions, uh, you actually have on that trigger 15 uh, distinct or 15 unique settings, uh, not only for weight, but leverage on the trigger, uh, the amount of creep as you go up. As you move the shoe up, you reduce creep. As you go down, you increase a creep. And then, uh, contrarily, you either increase or uh, reduce uh, you know, trigger pull weight. Uh, but you also adjust the position of your finger for comfort. Most people adjust the shoe uh, for comfort. Uh, and once they get some time on it, uh, you know, they, they find out other significant uh, things they like about it. Yeah, but it's absolutely. kind of the, uh, it's the ultimate in adjustability. No other trigger uh, has that as well. Yeah, it's, it is a pretty complex uh, design, and it seems pretty neat. I like it, you know. It's just something totally different and kind of thinking a little bit outside the box, so to speak, which is kind of applicable when you talk about a drop and trigger, kind of like a box. Um, the other thing I was going to ask is, uh, 
so as far as I know, you mentioned earlier about another trigger design that's going to work in full autos. What are the things we have coming down the line from Hyperfire? Well, uh, some of that uh, is under development and can't really say. Uh, people have made requests uh, for SCAR triggers, uh, ACR triggers, DeVor triggers, AK triggers, uh, you name it. We'll probably get to that eventually. Uh, we uh, ad adapted uh, an EDT trigger, enhanced duty trigger, to full auto, and we took one of the 24s and have adapted them to, 20, uh, to full auto. Uh, so those will be available. Uh, the nice thing about the full auto triggers uh, is you can shoot really fast. <laughs> Uh, if you have an NFA weapon or if you're in law enforcement, uh, for instance, or private contractor. Uh, but when you switch to semi, um, now you, you've got a rifle. Now you've got a rifle, really, really good trigger in it. You can't do that with a mil spec trigger to shoot full auto. There are other manufacturers with, with full auto triggers. I guess we're joining that club. Uh, we'll have to see how it goes. But we're pretty excited about it because it's one more uh, you know, flexible aspect we can offer now. Very cool. Um, as far as other products for the AR-15, I know we've got something here that's new that's not quite out yet. We want to talk about this, the Hyper Grip, which I guess yeah. I couldn't really see it because I had it on the screen. Right. But here uh, we go. There were people that kind of laughed at the name. Uh, so this is a Hyper Grip grip. Uh, and do we need another grip? Uh, and the answer, of course, uh, is yes, we do. <laughs> uh, this grip is different. Uh, and uh, we'll be explaining uh, when it's introduced and this is some detail what makes it different. But basically, it's, it's more uh, ergonomic than other grips that are out there. Uh, it fills in higher hands, so you're engaging all features of your hand. Uh, the arches between your fingers, the palm, the heel, uh, the thumb, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a natural pointer like a 1911, so when your hand is gripping uh, the grip, your finger's in a natural position. Uh, and it does some other things, too. Uh, that grip was actually developed uh, for the 50 we talked about earlier. Uh, so that grip is uh, 13 years old. Uh, but that's another adaptation for the AR that we've come out with. Uh, we've got this version, which you have on your rifle. It looks like it's the uh, as-molded version. Uh, okay. It's a little slick. It's a little polished. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a textured version where the extremities are, are roughed up uh, for those people that want uh, a little more uh, you know, friction uh, with their hand on the grip. Uh, but it's designed to give better control of the rifle uh, as well as a more, more relaxed action on the trigger. Uh, when you're relaxed, when you're not under stress, when you don't have tension in your hand, you're a better shot. Yeah, absolutely. You know. and, it's, and it's a very interesting grip, too. I mean, um, like you were saying, uh, we were kind of mentioning earlier a little bit, um, maybe off camera, about the, uh, the feel of this grip and some of the features. Basically, it kind of helps kind of keep your finger, your trigger finger, kind of planted where you kind of want it to be, ergonomically speaking. Um, that's what I've noticed. And... Uh, you were talking about the fact about the safety and how it kind of kind of sticks out a little bit further in respect. If you want to kind of explain that better than I can. Well, we have some ribbed uh, walls on either side of the grip uh, for those that run the AMBI controls, uh, the AMBI safe health selector. Uh, and it, it's ridged up to protect it. So when you're walking through the brush or it falls down, uh, you know, the safety selector is, is protected. Um, we can't add material to the grip, and some people do that. They actually add material to the grip so it better fits the hand. Uh, this mm -hmm. grip was made uh, large to begin with so you can uh, remove material. Uh, I know three gunners uh, who love the grip now. Uh, we've sent out some grips uh, you know, for T&E uh, and whatnot, and they've filed down those ridges around the safety selectors. So when they, when they wipe it with their thumb, there's nothing in the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had other people, and I think you mentioned this too, like with billet lowers, uh, there has to be some modification in the grip. You just take a file or a Dremel and remove some material. Uh, it was made to fit mil-spec lowers. Right. And, and it was a little bit tight on this one. This is the City and Arms uh, billet lower receiver. It's just just very, very small amount of material that had to be removed to make it seat properly. And I kind of figured that might be the case because billet you know, has its own spec, so to speak, I guess is the way to put it. Right. Um, you know, it's not a forging that that everybody has the same exact dimensions on so you might have some little small variance there and, and and it's kind of a nice way to go about it because really you can kind of shave it make it fit nice and tight against your receiver you know there's not gonna be any you know it's basically just extra support nice nice tight fit you know so um what other exciting things do you guys have going on over hyperfire as far as any shooting events or anything like that coming up uh, well, as far as shooting events, uh, no. Uh, there are a couple. I think there's a match in uh, 
Michigan soon. Uh, I think we're a sponsor. We'll have product in the prize table. Uh, we might be at uh, Blue Ridge. Uh, we might do some things there. Uh, I think next year, uh, Hyperfire will have more of a presence actually nationwide. Uh, we're planning on, on traveling uh, next year. Okay. Uh, we've done most everything we've done this year has been locally uh, at the uh, the matches here. We were sponsored at one of the major matches up here. Uh, and the last match, we actually uh, hosted a Hyperfire Challenge. We had a side stage. And so shooters were able to come up and, and double tap uh, two different targets with their rifle and then pick up. Uh, one of our rifles with some of our equipment and double tapped. Uh, that rifle, of course, had, uh, I think it was an Eclipse trigger. It had one of our grips and one of our comps, uh, which is a product that we're going to introduce at SHOT Show. I think we've oh, actually cool. had it at SHOT Show the last two shows, but and we did some testing, made some modifications, and uh, that's in pre-production right now. But the, the response uh, to the grip and to the comp was uh, very, very satisfying. Uh, we had some interesting looks on people's faces after they shot that rifle. Nice. Uh, they had more control in the comp. You could shoot it flat. You know, it just it was it was uh, rock solid. Very cool. So shot show. That's one of the other big yep. events that's coming up uh, this coming up year, every as every year. Yes. So I'm um, yeah. This year shot. Yeah, this year shot. We're actually going to have a booth. Uh, we're going to have structure. It's going to be different. Uh, so we're going to demonstrate that hyperfire has grown a little bit. Uh, we're going to have a video loop running on a big screen TV with a lot of interesting things on that. People will want to watch that. And we're also going to be, uh, we're going to have a lane at uh, Industry Day at the range. Uh, we're awesome. going to have our rifles. Uh, we'll have some machine guns there. Uh, they'll be semi-auto only. You won't be able to select fire those. But we can show some equipment uh, on the machine guns. Very awesome. And there'll be, uh, there'll be some other things. Uh, we had planned for a really big event at SHOT Show, but uh, we're putting that off until uh, NRA. We have to do a little more engineering. Okay. It's understandable. That's that's the fun yep. thing about this, the, the creative aspect that goes behind all these designs of products for not only just AR-15s, but just in the gun industry in general. Um, it's it's a fun, fun, fascinating thing to me. So how does it go from, with you guys, how did it go from just the, the idea to a final product with this? I mean, really, with the trigger, for example, um, I'm imagining it took a long time, a lot of, and how many people were involved with just the, the overall design of it? Well, it was all me. Uh, there was no one else. I had uh, wow. service providers, uh, foundries, machine shops, uh, one not. But uh, like I said, I founded uh, the LLC in January of uh, 2011 and didn't have the 24 ready until I think it was uh, April or May of uh, 13. So it, it was prototyping. It was finding out uh, the limits of uh, machining. I had to find shops that, uh, that could meet my specs, uh, but do it in uh, an affordable way. Uh, these triggers have twice as many parts as uh, many of the competitors, yet we're cost competitive. So True. Uh, there was uh, certainly some engineering involved. Uh, there was some testing on my part and some other people, uh, friends of mine, uh, that were able to help me out. But much of it, too, was just serendipity. I lucked out. Uh, you know, many people try to start businesses and they have problems, but uh, for me, anyway, it worked out, and I'm very happy about that. And I'm very grateful for the people that did work with me. Um, it uh, it took a while to find the sweet spot. So when I had the HyperTouch 24, I, I thought that was it. And then yeah. I thought to myself, I was talking to my national sales rep, and I was thinking, you know what? I think I can reduce creep. I, I, I think I can you know, do better with this. And the more I worked on it, the better I got at it. And uh, I was able to uh, take what I was putting on uh, in a solid model on the computer and uh, crank it out of a machine, and it actually it actually worked. It was a matter of finesse. We're, we're talking about between the, the Hybrid Touch 24 series and the Eclipse, uh, we're talking a thousandths of an inch difference in how much material is removed from a sear. And it makes and, a huge difference. Yeah, and you have to be able to control how much you move, you know, w within some tolerance. And that was really the trick. And uh, you know, from my viewpoint, engineering is uh, is the art of approximation or the art of compromise. There are always trade-offs. You know, if you do this, then that affects something else. But I think what the triggers, we found a very good balance, and it's quite remarkable. I think that's partly due to the, the mechanics I was talking about before that that toggle spring uh, aspect. It takes so much force off the sear. Now you can manage small amounts, and you can feel that in the finger. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very cool design. Well, Terry, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, and for the support of the project here for the Minnesota Rifle and the 50 states of AR-15. Uh, hopefully we'll see you on a SHOT Show this uh, coming year as well. 
Um, and so uh, to everybody watching, again, thanks for the support and uh, for everything. And uh, until next time, go out and have some fun shooting.